你的群体在被边缘化，但是我是一定会出轨的。Um, okay. Hi. Um, those comments that you just saw—they're—they're they're hard to read, and it just—just just really shows how words mean a lot, and that I—I I don't give a shit, dude. Oh, you want to cry because your favorite waifu is coded to be a girl kisser? Oh my god, I'm so sorry, that's so sad. My condolences. You know, maybe if you cry enough, you can save California from their drought. And then we'd both be considered patriots. <laughs> god bless America. Hey, welcome back to my channel, or welcome to my channel. My name is E, as in like, empath, because that's what I am. And today I am back to prove to you that Genshin Impact is a queer game. <gasps> I know, I know, settle down guys. It's crazy of me to say. Some of you are already in the comment section typing some slanderously ignorant things and I haven't even spoken yet. So you know, I'll give you a second, I'll give you a second. Are you done? The only thing that I ask of you my dear viewer, is that you watch this video in its entirety, and then please feel free to share your thoughts in the comments down below. That's literally all. Thank you. So to start off this video, let's talk about the roadmap. First, I will very briefly be recapping what we talked about in the first video when it comes to what exactly queer coding is and Holy versus past with it. Then after the brief recap, I'll be giving you a very brief summary of queer rights in the US, but mostly in China, just to give you more of a perspective on where Hoyoverse is coming from and how important the representation is in the game and how important representation just is in general. Then I will very quickly be combating some of your arguments that you put in the last video. Then we will of course be diving into three more of Genshin Impact's most queer coded ships to prove to you that yes, Genshin Impact is a queer game and I'm just not making stuff up, I promise. <laughs> so yes, a very ambitious video again. So I hope you're comfortable and I hope you have some snacks, maybe some some hot cocoa because it is the holiday season. Also, happy Halloween. Let's get cozy, let's get comfortable, and let's get started, okay? Also, hey, please like the video and subscribe so I can continue to make deep dives like this. And also, please join us over on twitch.tv forward slash ESocial. Anyways, let's get on to the video. So part one, what is queer coding? So queer coding is when storytellers use subtle signifiers to convey to an audience that a character is queer because either A, they can't really talk about queerness due to the time or culture that the piece of media is existing in, or B, it isn't overly important to the story. It's usually the former. These signifiers can be through how the character moves through the world, through how they speak, walk, dress, or using color symbolism, cultural signifiers, or how they interact with other characters, or even their character arcs could be seen as metaphors for queer journeys. Again, I gave more examples in the last video, so definitely go watch that after this one. I differentiated this from queer baiting, which is often very confused with queer coding. Baiting and coding can be sniffed out based on the intent on the creator's side. Genshin Impact can always be seen as coding due to the censorship guidelines that it exists in in China. Queer characters and relationships are just not to be talked about, so any representation of them exists in the form of coding. I also want to reiterate the past that Hoyo has with coding characters to be gay while also explicitly canonized a few. With Branya and Sila from previous Honkai games having a romantic relationship with each other in every iteration they show up in and sharing a canonical kiss in the webtoon and Kiana and Mei also being confirmed to be queer and in love. Again, I feel like I have to scream this at the top of my lungs. Hoya First does not need to make queer characters. If anything, if they do, it's detrimental to them. Most if not all huge global games like Genshin do not include queer storylines because they will get more hate than anything because we live in an outstandingly homophobic world, or they themselves also are homophobic. Especially living in China, where they're literally just not allowed to talk about queer people or queer relationships, and they have a history of canonizing, not even coding, canonizing queer relationships. They can get in so much trouble, so like why even risk it? So this honestly should dispel any doubt that you have that Hoyaverse has made queer characters and can make 
queer characters. If a company is willing to do it once, then any future attempts should be taken seriously, especially with a game like Genshin, which is so big that they don't have the liberty to be more openly canon with these relationships like they have in their smaller known games like Honkai. This is honestly one of the most important pieces of evidence that I could ever provide to you in any of these videos that I make on the topic. So I really can't stress it enough how important this is to what I'm trying to talk about today. That's just a theme. So I didn't do this next part in the last video, but I think it would really aid us in our journey of understanding queer coding and understanding representation and how cool it is that Hoyaverse does it and how important it is in popular media by giving you a very brief history of queer rights in the West and the East leading up to this present day. I think it really adds so much more in-depth understanding to the very nuanced topics that we are discussing today. Just to give a very brief overview of queer rights in America, it wasn't until the infamous Obergefell versus Hodges case in 2015, did the Supreme Court legalize gay marriage across the entire nation? 2015, <laughs> hey, that wasn't even a decade ago. That's crazy. Only until very recently did including queer stories and media start to become more normalized, but with how divided everything is in this country, suddenly mentioning someone who's queer is deemed woke or a political agenda. Hey, sorry to tell you this, but queer people existing isn't political. Hope this helps. I have gotten so many comments trying to delegitimize my efforts in trying to explain the queer representation in this game. And I just want to let you know that yes, it is just a game, but representation is still very important, especially to people who are struggling with their inner queer identities in a society where gay marriage hasn't even been fully legal yet for 10 years. So shut up. Anyways, <laughs> in terms of Genshin and how its cultural environment influences its queer storytelling, let's take a quick trip down history lane, shall we? I'm a big history nerd, so I love this part. China is one of the few modern day nations that has thousands of years of written history to detail how life was during its entire existence. China has not quite existed like we know it today. Its history is made up of many eras of different types of rulers, dynasties, warring factions, peace, and such, but all were interconnected with an enduring, gorgeous culture. In its very extensive past, queer life was greatly accepted and even encouraged. Bisexuality was quite the norm during the Han Dynasty, where all 10 emperors were very openly bisexual and had what was termed a male favorite, according to Brett Hinch's The Passions of the Cut Sleeve essay. Male favorites were often lovers that the emperors had, in addition to their wives, that they would spoil and douse with riches. Emperor Ai was the more famous example, which is where the Passion of the Cut Sleeve story originated from. I talked about the Cut Sleeve story in depth in the last video, but TLDR, saying cut sleeve or passion of the cut sleeve is a euphemism for queer love. There are even examples of queer behavior even before the Han Dynasty and the Shou Dynasty where the story of the bitten peach originated, which is the story where the Duke Ling of Wei was strolling in an orchard with Michi Xia and Michi Xia bit into a peach and wished to share it with the Duke. The Duke was smitten by his gesture. So this phrase of the bitten peach, which was to refer to queer love, was born. Fast forward hundreds of years, homosexuality and queer life is not openly accepted at all anymore. The government has never made an official statement regarding the existence of queer people in China, but in 1997, hooliganism was decriminalized which was reportedly assumed to refer to acts of homosexuality as reported by the Atlantic's Tabitha Spielman. And homosexuality was removed as a mental disorder in 2001. Okay, but uh, hooliganism? Tomfoolery even. Hijinks if you're so inclined. Fellas, is it hooliganism to kiss your homie? <laughs> but of course, there is no set of rights given to homosexual people on a political level, and people often keep their identity to themselves for the fear of losing their jobs or social status. Due to this, queer people often engage in heterosexual marriages to avoid suspicions from family members or potential employers. The term tongchi refers to straight women who marry gay men, which is a practice that often occurs in queer circles. Overall, queer act activism and life in China is vibrant and gorgeous, with Shanghai Pride being a beautiful festival of queer celebration, but it is still generally not accepted. You can still lose your job 
for being queer. And as I stated in the previous video, actively portraying queer themes in popular culture is not allowed. Under Xi Jinping's current rule, queer TV shows and media were actively being taken down, according to the Global Times, where the popular online drama, Addiction, was taken down from its streaming platform. It was a series about a love story between two teenage boys. This was during a time when the government was publicly calling for censorship, with new guidelines that prohibited adultery, smoking, witchcraft, reincarnation, young romance, and of course, queer relationships in 2014, as reported by Amy Chin of the Chinese branch of the New York Times. Additionally, in 2022, there was a wave of queer WeChat accounts that were being taken down, as reported by restoftheworld.org's Lavender Ao and White Chi Lu's article on the topic. Many queer people, especially college queer societies, existed online as a way to organize and form as a community. And within a few short weeks in July of 2022, many queer accounts were deleted, with the largest account that connected literally thousands of members across the country taken down. So you can't marry, you can't hold a job, and you can't even congregate online in mainland China if you are queer. So again, Hoiver's showing canon queer couples in their previous works and any attempts to do so with queer themes in their stories should be taken very seriously. So don't you find this context really important to understanding Hoyaverse and Genshin Impact and everything that I'm talking about? So keep it with you, keep this context and knowledge with you as we move on to our next section of the video, uh, which is about to start right now. <laughs> Excellent transition. <laughs> I'm just here to fight. So I gave you this history lesson, not only to give you context that surrounds Hoyaverse and Genshin Impact, but also to prove to you just how important representation is because it is important. It might not be to you if you're not queer, but it is very important to your loved ones or people that you know that happen to be queer. It is often through the media that we consume that we are taught right from wrong. Generations were raised on popular cultures that villainized queer people, made fun of, stereotyped. So imagine where queer representation is just the norm. How many kids won't get bullied on the playground? How many kids will just feel better about themselves in the end? It's important, it is important. And it is especially important and very cool to find representation in a game like Genshin, whether it exists as coding or not, where queer history and acceptance in China is very convoluted. So a lot of people in the comments section on the last video dumped a lot of uh, phrases or arguments and I would like to address them now just to you know clear any confusion and so that we're all on the same page so let's begin the first argument is why does everything have to be gay I never claimed and never will claim that every single relationship and interaction in Genshin is gay, okay? I select these relationships purposefully because they have what I believe the highest amount of queer coding evidence that backs them. Just because I point out some pieces of evidence that are actually very valid doesn't mean that everybody is gay. But also, would it be so terrible? Why can't they be friends? Again, in popular media, they are often always just friends. It is not silly or ridiculous to look at the hints and nudges to tell us that maybe a couple is more than just friends. Gay people do exist, you know, so why can't they just exist in popular forms of media? It's a normal game. Stop making it weird. It isn't gay. Hey, again, just listen to what I'm saying. Also, what the fuck does normal mean? It's a video game. It's a fantasy game. It doesn't have to reflect real life. Hey, quick question. Why is your ideal fantasy world a world that doesn't include queer people? Quickly, answer. Also, Genshin does base the regions of Tevat on real life cultures. So why wouldn't real life people also be in the game? Are we just drawing the line randomly now? It's a Chinese game. So of course there won't be any gay people. Hey, hi, sorry, gay Chinese people exist. You people are crazy. You are homophobic. Hope this helps. Okay guys, you know the drill. If you see any of the comments that I just talked about in the comment section down below, then just tag them to this portion of the video. Don't even waste your time on them, all right? Cause we all know that they didn't actually watch the video. So you know what to do. So let's get into the actual meat of the video, which is queer coding evidence. So now it is time to start with the queer coding of Genshin Impact. 
Our favorite familial unit is here. Our first ship of the day will be Sino Nari. Sino Nari is a very popular ship between Sino and Tignity, if you are not familiar. Tignity is a forest watcher and protector of the Avidia forest, who is also an expert in botany. He is greatly admired by professionals in his field and got amazing grades while in the academia. He doesn't really vibe with the whole academia lifestyle and decided to become a forest ranger instead, where his knowledge was put into more use. He is someone who I see as a no bull kind of person. Sino, on the other hand, is the general Mahamatra. He enforces the academia's rules. If you are performing an illegal study or disobeying the academia in any way, you will be getting a visit from Sino. He is the leader of the Matras and very powerful in Sumeru. Rarely do you ever see him, and when you do, it's usually because you are guilty and it's not going to end well for you. He instills fear wherever he goes, but while Sino is in the company of Tignity, he is a completely different person. He knows how he is perceived by others, so he tries to crack jokes to lighten the mood, which usually makes him more unnerving by those who aren't familiar with him. But Tignity, Tignity is very familiar with Sino. Sino is goofy as heck. Dude, this dude is one corny guy. He is constantly making puns and jokes around Tignity to the point where Tignity is sick of them and he's the biggest TCG nerd fanboy. No one else would have the gall to cut off the general Mahamatra, but Tignity actively points out how bad these jokes are and how nerdy he is. In Wimbloom's breath, the pair take Kale to visit Monset together to ensure her safety. Sino is role-playing as an adventurer the whole time and dude is so corny, oh my God, I love him so much. Tignity pointed out that he he was acting this way because he saw everyone around him as friends, but also that his jokes were ruining the reputation of Sumeru for all of Mondstadt. Again, only Tignity could talk to him like this. Their closeness is emphasized almost every turn in their friendship. In Tignity's character story four, the story of how they met is described. Tignity was making quite a name for himself while in the academia, getting very high grades and praise from his colleagues. He was mostly solitary, but was kind to others who wanted to collaborate with him on projects or just to hear his thoughts. He was so popular, in fact, that it caught the attention of Sino, who immediately thought there was foul play. Sino was suspicious that an individual was able to gather so many around him and grow so powerful socially. But when he truly got to know Tignity, he realized what a kind and honest soul Tignity had. They then grew a friendship between the two of them, with Sino often letting his guard down around the other man. When Sino brought Kale to Sumeru after helping her to conceal her powers, he took her to Tignity, where the pair took on a sort of parental or older brother role to the girl, helping her to read and write and grow into herself. Sino lives in the city, but visits a video forest often to have dinner with the two of them, and sometimes talks about bringing back treats, like like candied agilinic nuts to Tignity and Kale. I don't know how to say that, I'll be real. The two often go out of their ways to be able to see the other, with Tignity making a trip to see Sino even though he hates the desert, while Sino was in Caravan Rebat, and with Sino making the trip to the forest to have dinner very often. The trust they have for each other should be noted as well, with Sino bringing back injured people to Tignity often to be healed, so much so that Tignity complains about it. During the Archon quest while they plan to free Nahida, Sino remarks that they will need Tignity's help, though the Traveler didn't think he would help if he knew the whole plan. Sino said not to worry and to only give Tignity the message that Sino sent them and Tignity would be on board. When the Traveler does tell Tignity of Sino's involvement, Tignity asks zero questions and goes along with the Traveler, having complete trust in Sino's judgment. Later, when Tignity is injured, I won't say how in case of spoilers, Sino is shown to be distressed and asked who orchestrated the attack. Additionally, Tignity is still hiding Karkata and Party's DI from the Academia, who is a mechanical life form from Histori Quest. Experimenting with mechanical life is strictly forbidden in the academia, but Tignity sees it as a life and decided to take care of it. Tignity mentions in passing that he told Amatra that he has Karkata and for the Traveler not to worry. It could be safely assumed that he's talking about Sino. Additionally, there are rumors about a mysterious figure around Party's DI, but an investigation shut them down. It is very likely Sino is actively covering for Tignity so that he doesn't get in trouble. Sino is very serious when it comes to upholding academia law and that goes for everyone, no matter who they are, even the sages. Sino found the sages guilty for their detestable abuse of power and helped bring them to justice. Though I'm sure Sino agrees with Tignity's assessment on the whole Karkata situation, he is actively breaking his own special rules to make sure Tignity is unharmed. The two have voice lines about each other, where Sino has two for Tignity. Tignity's voice lines about him first showcase that he visits him and Kale often, and that he is able to distinguish what his footsteps sound like. It seems like Sino wants to keep his 
his presence hidden, but it seems he does that to not worry Kale, since his presence reminds her of her past, which he was a part of. In Sino's voice lines about Tignity, he talks very fondly about how Tignity isn't like other scholars and how much respect he has for the man. Here is what I describe as fondness in his voice. Some scholars see themselves as gods within their own laboratories, but not Tainari. He has always shown the same respect for every form of life. Ricky, when I catch you, Ricky, Ricky, when I catch you, Ricky, Ricky, when I catch you. In his second, he talks about how Tignity has rules of the dinner table, which seems to be important. It's a table they share so often that it's no longer Tignity's table, it's the table together. Sano even invites Kave over to Tignity's to eat, like it was his own house. Kave rambled the whole time about Alhitham, which the two found kind of funny. If you want more on Kave Thum, go watch the first video. Yeah, we talk about it, girl. Another sweet set of evidence is in the teapot. In the descriptions of various types of plants, you see excerpts from the Matra's Manual, which is a booklet Sino wrote for his subordinates to stay safe while they are out on missions. In Chilling Sand Grilling, the leaf veins supple and subtle, and no jumping, no tramping, a sort of story is told with each having a description from the Matra's manual, and then the Matra's reaction to the material within it. The young Matra wonder who is Sino consulting when it comes to the expert botanical knowledge within it. It isn't until No Jumping No Tramping, when a Matra is described confronting Sino in Gandharvaville about who the botanist is that he consults. Sino is actually talking with Tignity at this time, and it seems like they're having dinner, and tells two jokes to the Matra that make no sense at all. Tignity butts in and tries to shut down the conversation before Sino could continue with his joke explanation, again, showing how much he knows him. And in the manual, there's an item called Letters in the Sands Half Buried, which is where if you use specific leaves and specific kinds of dye together, you are able to write letters secretively in what is essentially disappearing ink, where the words will only show if you affect it with electro first and then dendro, which is Sino and Tignity's elements, hinting that they might send secret letters to each other, which is a little sus. I find it very interesting that the writers decided to read the focus in on who is this secret relationship that Sino was having with somebody and how the Matras actively wanted to uncover it. It seems like a point of evidence to really like point out something that seems to be secretive, even though it shouldn't, they're just friends, but it seems like they're like, hey, look at this relationship. There's something here, but that's just, that's just me. Okay, so after all of that, let's start to unpack the very specific evidences of queer coding specifically. To take the position of the devil's advocate, this could very well just be a very good friendship between very close, best friends, and that it isn't romantic like at all. Just because two people are so close like Tignity and Sino doesn't mean that they are romantically involved. But this is another case of Genshin storytelling where the two of them seem to be a package deal. They share a relationship that is so intertwined and connected that it is hard to say it isn't supposed to be implied. Again, I want to bring up evidence from the last video where there were leaked documents online from a recent video game conference in Beijing where censorship rules were being reviewed. These documents prohibited overly effeminate men and I quote, the love story of same-sex characters we will limit the word use in such a story. You can only say they are best friends. Hold your hat, folks. In Kaveh's voice line about Sino, Kaveh talks about how Tignity refers to Sino as his best friend. And in the Interdarshan Championship event, Sino refers to Tignity as his best friend. Guys, it's all about the context, again. All that I laid out before you indicates a very close relationship. They write letters to each other in secret with methods only they are capable of decoding. They both take care of Kale together and see each other as a family, mention each other and are pictured with each other at any given opportunity and trust their entire lives to each other while also sharing a dinner table. I'm so sorry, but if Sino or Tignity were a girl, I feel like they would be widely accepted as just like, being married. Everything that they have behind them just kind of indicates like not even a relationship. It just feels like marriage. So I feel like if either of them were the opposite gender, we would just kind of accept that they were canon at that point. And again, if you take in Hoya versus past with canonizing queer couples and how they're only allowed to code and use the term best friends to refer to gay people, well, then it's kind of like, eh. You know, you know. There is one piece of evidence that people often say to combat the validity of this ship, which was when Sino, Tignity, and Kale said they saw all three of them as siblings during their recent moth set event. Honestly, you can take this however you want to. I saw it initially as they act like older brothers to Kale, but that they recognize how close 
the family the three of them are. This could very well be a translation thing as well, where it is commonplace to refer to people you are close to as brother or sister in China. It doesn't necessarily mean like, I literally see you as a brother or sister, but it's more used as a term of sincere endearment and even flirting at times. It's really just to show a really close connection or bond from what I understand. I don't really see this as a point to counteract all of the evidence I just gave you, but I wanted to address it because some people do. So I will admit the evidence and the queer coding is not overly in abundance like it is for the other ships we're gonna be talking about in this video or for like Beiguan or Kave Tham, right? But it just feels like a general vibe and also a really good example of how queer coding exists and how characters can interact with each other. But just positioning Sino and Tikindi as parental units to Kale is kind of uh, signaling a trope of found family, which is very often a queer coded trope. So this ship is kind of acting like how Jean Lisa was for the last video. Not too much evidence, but it really is a good example of how queer coding can be very severe or very subtle. And it's good to put it in comparison to the other ships that we are about to talk about to show you just how much coding there is in those ships as well. So anyways, what are your thoughts on Sinonari? I personally see them as being together and however, just can't really tell us. Also, Alejandro Saab, the voice actor of Sino, thinks they're together and he thinks that they are heavily implied too. At a convention once, a fan asked him in the crowd to say, I love you, Tignity. And um, well, this happened. In Sino's okay. voice, can you say, I love you, Tainari? All right, all right. I love you, Tainari. <laughs> And also when Mario was released and Peaches, the song sung by Bowser was making its meme rounds, Alejandro decided to make a cover of it as Sino. So he decided to sing about Tignity in a romantic way. He got a mysterious email telling him to take it down. Hey, he hit a nerve. So it's not just crazy people thinking that they are together that you deem crazy. It's uh, professional working voice actors like Alejandro Saab. Hey. If we see it, we see it, you know? I saw gay, so I said gay. So yeah, that is our first ship down. So on to the next one. Well. Okay, time for our next ship, which is Xingyun, which is the ship between Changyun and Xingqiu. Before we start, I wanna give a huge shout out to Ham for Yams, who made a 39 page document detailing the ins and outs of Changyun's and Xingqiu's relationship to me. I would have been lost without their help. They are the Xingyun expert, so we're in good hands. If you want to read this document, which I highly suggest, it will be in the Discord for you to read, so make sure to join the Discord if you'd like to access it. The link for the Discord is in the description down below along with all the other links that I used for today's video. So let's start out with our boys. As we know, Chang Yun is a young Tianhang thaumaturge slash exorcist. And due to his pure yang spirit, ghosts usually flee before he's able to exorcise them. So he's actually never seen a ghost. But because of his pure yang spirit, he is prone to having a yang attack, where if he encounters too much heat, spicy foods, or any strong emotions, he may either pass out or have a complete personality change that in the past has led him to jumping on stage with Xin Yun during a performance to sing with her, eating patrons food at Changling's restaurant while he bragged about his clan, and even destroying Wang Shu In's property after dancing with his claymore, which Xing Chou ended up paying for to cover. Chang Yun is a very sensitive, deeply caring person who, due to being a workaholic, is very naive since he didn't have a typical childhood around other kids and is prone to getting tricked. This is where Xing Chou comes in, who is very different from Chang Yun. Xing Chou is part of the Fei Yun Commerce Guild, who has a lot of pressure on his shoulders for not only maintaining a flawless facade to keep the guild's reputation up, but also he carries high expectations from his family, wanting him to aid the family business when he is older. But of course, he is a complete nerd and would rather live in his books than with the reality he is currently in. He consumes fantasy novels like they are the air he breathes and he adores the action heroes in them, where he adopted a very strong sense of justice with his personal motto being, be good, do good. He's a good person at heart, and I do believe he gets misinterpreted by the general fandom, which I myself am guilty of before reading more into him and his background. But more on that later. Together, these two make an unlikely duo. Ching Cho seems to truly let himself go around Chang Yun, and they are very comfortable with each other and are shown to be a package deal again throughout the times we encounter them in the story. If Chang Yun is around, Ching Cho is not far away, or if they don't end up being in the same scene together, the other is often mentioned or talked about. They are always going on 
on expeditions and commissions together in search of evildoers and ghosts. And these trips often last days at a time, with Chu, one of the servants from the guild, having to cover for Xing Chao when he is gone from his familial duties. As Ham points out in the document, they are shown together are referenced to be in several locations around Tibet. Liwei Harbor, where they live, Wang Shu Inn, Dreyun Karst, and Chingsa Village. According to Ham's calculations, every six to seven real life minutes is equivalent to an hour in game. So it takes a whole game day to travel from Liwei Harbor to Wangshu Inn, which means it takes two to three days from the harbor to Tingsha Village. So needless to say, they spend a lot of time with each other. So yes, best friends hanging out a lot, what? Best friends don't do that. That must mean they're gay. No, it's not what I'm saying. Not every single friendship is gay, all right? But this one is. <laughs> so everything that I have explained thus far is to explain their canonical dynamic that is not coded to be either way, in my personal opinion. So let's get to the parts that are implied. Their designs. They're an almost perfect inversion of the other, with Chongyun's lighter blue color scheme mirroring Xingqiu's darker blue. If you invert their designs, they adapt the other's color scheme with matching golden accessories between the two of them. This mirrored inversion of the other can closely be linked to yin and yang imagery, which is not a far-fetched image to pull from since they are Liyuan and Liyue is based off of China where yin and yang originates. And because duh, dude, Chang'in is literally born with a powerful yang spirit. So that half of the imagery is already intrinsically tied with Chang'in. But what about Xingqiu? In Chinese mythology, the male or yang energy is often associated with the dragon and the female or yin energy is matched with the image of a phoenix. If you look into the subtle pattern on Xingqiu's coat, you will notice that the pattern is that of a phoenix. Phoenix. This along with the fact that Xing Chou is arguably very feminine with his attire, androgynous hair, and elegant way of holding himself, it is a very strong indication that it was intentional for Xing Chou to literally be the yin to Chang Yun's yang. Dragons are very strong and powerful, with this being the case for Chang Yun since his yang spirit is so remarkable. And phoenixes are known to be graceful, virtuous, and beautiful, which definitely matches with Xing Chou. Additionally, imagery with the dragon and phoenix are known to be a very lucky sign, with the word in Chinese for luck being this. Xing Yun. Oh, why does that sound so familiar? I swear I've heard that before. Where have I? Oh, right. It sounds like the combination of their names together, which is this. Xing Yun. Maybe it's a little red string on the wall, but it's interesting. How do I say this? Um, they're soulmates. How can you not look at all the evidence I just provided to you just now and think that they're not soulmates? And also like, shut up. <laughs> that is not a buddy thing to do. Like, hey pal, wanna be intrinsically linked on the spiritual level in every way, shape and form? <laughs> Sounds very unromantic, very buddy of us to do. You're joking. Be for real. Grow up. Grow up. Additionally, as I said earlier, Xing Chou is very feminine, with many, uh, myself included, misgendering him when we first saw him. As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, hey, that history lesson is coming back into importance right now. The CCP has been striking down very hard on popular media, with an increased limitation on femboy or feminine men depiction. In this new set of censorship laws, men just shouldn't be wearing earrings at all, which further the displays how intentionally they made Xing Chou represent Yin qualities. He is the only Liwen character to have an earring on his right side, which in the West, men with their right ears pierced do this to denote their homosexuality. Again, this is a Western piece of coding that honestly holds zero ground in the context that we were talking about, but I only mention it because it's a very interesting character detail to include. Also, when it's paired with the fact that men just shouldn't be wearing earrings in general, I thought I should include it. Also, Chang Yun's design is very heavily based on the types of exorcist characters in wuxia novels, novels in Chinese literature based on martial arts in ancient China. Xing Chao's genre of choice in his books are wuxia novels. So it's a point to be made that Chang Yun fits the exact description of the characters that Xing Chao idolizes and builds his ideals off of, so that's sweet. Now they show up in a lot of events together, like the fleeting colors in flight in 2.4, where they watch the scenery of Xing Shan village together. They show up in the exquisite night chimes or 3.4's lantern, right? Where they have a lot of endearing interactions. And then of course, there is the famous scene from the Moon Chase Festival in 2.1, which is the first time we see them together. So it truly sets the scene for their relationship. They are their usual friends in cutscenes and in the main storyline. But once we visit them outside a cutscene, we can overhear their conversation with each other, which is really sus. They're talking about books, right? And Ching Cho's like, hmm, all right, let me read you a book called Young and Hopelessly Smitten. It's 
So I don't know. Between what is essentially a guidebook and a romance book, of course Chang Yun's gonna pick the romance book. So Xing Chou gets to read him a book about being young and hopelessly smitten. Then I'll read one for you. How about young and hopelessly smitten? Hey buddy, hey pal, how about you get comfortable and I can serenade you with my voice as I read you a story about being young and in love, which is kind of crazy, it's kind of like us, but not like us at all because we're not romantically implied at all. Um, I'm sick of it. <laughs> I'm sick of these little gay people. Like, why include this scene? The writers sat down and went, oh yeah, this is flames, dude. Put it in, code it in. Queer code it in, if, if you will. <laughs> Okay. I will admit, before doing all of my research for today's video, I was not 100% convinced that Hoyaverse was purposely queer coding this friendship to be romantic. But this, this scene and their imagery together, when is it when there's so many coincidences that it isn't a coincidence anymore? And oh boy, we aren't even done yet, okay? I said in depth, so we are being in depth. In Changyun's hangout quest, it is heavily implied that Xing Chou leaves him clues to go on another bogus ghost hunt. The clues lead him to a a flyer that invites people to come with their best friend for a test of courage. Chang Yun thinks this is a serious invitation to go eradicate some ghosts, when really it's just like a haunted house, essentially. His best friend is already busy, Xing Chou, so he asks the traveler instead. When they show up, it is a haunted house, but for couples, it's a date exercise. It is speculated that Xing Chou left these clues so that Chang Yun would ask him to go on this test of courage date thing, but there is a theory that the reason why Xing Chou was too busy for Chang Yun to ask him was probably because chronologically he was too busy with the Cheng the Ninth stuff. Though this is speculation about the timeline, so take it with a grain of salt. But it is weird that Xing Chou wanted Chang Yun to end up there. And it is a point to make. It truly was the date that almost was. Chang Yun's first birthday letter is weird as heck because he sends us silk flowers instead of core lapis, which is his ascension material. Meanwhile, silk flowers are Xing Chou's ascension material. Did we accidentally get a letter meant for Xing Chou? In the Wings of Golden Flight text, we get a story about two aspiring martial artists that are known to carry out chivalrous deeds in secret throughout Lei Wei, where they pierce through rainbows and slice through frost. Chang Yun is a cryo user, so he's the one slicing through frost and Xing Chou's character introduction is called Only Rainbows Come After Rain. He is the one piercing rainbows, so the text is obviously about them. For Xing Chou's rainbow imagery, I mean like, hey, rainbow. So no, not every single rainbow denotes queerness, okay? But in this context, when we're talking about a character that is pretty sus having rainbow imagery, it's a point to point out, okay? Also, it should be noted that in ancient Chinese legend, the symbol of union between yin and yang was a rainbow. Again. Just coincidences, just coincidences, okay? Additionally, there was a Genshin-sponsored broadcasting program on Billy Billy called the Liyue Salon, where some of the Genshin voice actors were featured in. They acted as their respective characters and performed a segment in the show that was essentially an advice column, where the people of Liyue sent in some questions for the god Rix Lapis to answer himself. Everything written for the segment was written by the staff, so their validity and possibility for canon is to be taken seriously. They got a question from the anonymous author of A Legend of Sword. This is Xing Chou. The advice that Xing Chou asks is, what would Rex Lapis do in this incident that occurred between him and his best friend, Chang Yun? Where Xing Chou sang to him for his birthday, and during Xing Chou's performance, Chang Yun got so overheated that he got a nosebleed. Chang Li's response to this was a bit of awkward laughter and then changing the subject. If you are a weeb, it is a common trope for characters to experience a nosebleed when they are, uh, let's just say very excited. Yes, this is a trope in Japanese anime, but it is also very prevalent in Chinese dramas as well. And it means the same thing. So having a nosebleed for bad singing means one thing and one thing only, he really liked the singing. <sighs> all right, there is a lot here that we talked about. And I'm not even mentioning all of the official arts that they're shown together. So many of them, look at them. They're still going. Hey, look at this slideshow, isn't it so cute? And there are absolutely more pieces of evidence that I could cite, but I feel like this was enough, if not more than enough to talk about for today's video. Now I want to quickly address some issues people have with this ship, or more realistically, issues that people have with Xing Chou in particular. Xing Chou is a huge prankster. It runs in the family. And because Chang Yun is so naive, Chang Yun is usually the target of these pranks. The pranks usually end up in Chang Yun having a yang attack, or he is sent on bogus exorcism 
some leads. I see how often in the fandom where Shinto is labeled as a cruel friend or someone with pure malintent. I see him as a little shit, obviously, but I don't see him as a cruel person or a bad friend at all. In his defense, I think he sends Chang Yoon on bogus ghost leads to help Chang Yoon let loose a bit. Chang Yoon never takes time for himself, and by following some of these clues, he has an excuse for taking part in normal activities, like having to read fun books because apparently there's a clue in there. Chang Yoon's also not really hurting anyone or is himself hurt when he has a yang attack. He just becomes very extroverted and he's ashamed of it. And if it does go too far, Xing Cho covers for it. So I don't see this as Xing Cho trying to intentionally hurt him. Xing Cho does take it too far sometimes and once showed how bad he felt for taking it too far with Chang Yoon. Like in Chang Yoon's character story 4, where Chang Yoon got swindled out of money due to a bogus lead Xing Cho sent him on. So Xing Cho quickly fixed it. I don't agree with how Xing Cho performs these pranks. When he goes too far, he fixes it and realizes when something is no longer in good fun. Xing Cho does have a lot of pressure on his shoulders, so I suspect this behavior is the result of him A, being very comfortable around Chang Yoon, and B, letting himself loose and being a little silly, something he can't be often. Chang Yoon, still after being deceived by Xing Cho, still seems to place a whole lot of trust and respect into his friend, so their friendship still seems pretty healthy. I would also like the court to realize that Xing Cho is probably like, 14 at best? Bro's a kid and he's cringe. He's not like a fully grown man who's pulling pranks on his best friend just to get a kick out of it. He's a kid, he's cringe, and he's clueless as much as he likes to act that he isn't. We all don't get it at that age, so relax on the whole Xing Cho's a bad person thing, okay? He's literally a f kid. He's like 12. <laughs> now, for my own personal headcanons and belief, I do not think that they are in a relationship with each other yet. I don't think they've confessed. I don't even think that one of them is even aware of their feelings for the other. But I do think the coding present is to point out their low-key crushes on each other and their possible future confirmed romance. They truly do seem to be soulmates. My headcanon is that Xing Chao is aware of his feelings for Chang Yoon and doesn't know how to handle it, so he pulls pranks, teases, and is overall little shit. I think Chang Yoon is very innocent, strict in his beliefs and naive, so I myself don't think he himself is aware of his romantic feelings. I do think that with time though, one of them will confess and they will eventually end up together. I will also add that Xing Cho's internal conflict between the son he is expected to be and his desire to be an author in something other than what he is expected to be is a common metaphor that mirrors queer people's inner struggle with their queerness. It is a very common trope and story for queer people to endure, that of wanting to love yourself but also being something different from what your family and society wants of you. So I think that is a very valid character aspect story thing to point out. And with that, the Chang Yun Xing Cho analysis is complete. Whew. I told you in depth and we're, we went in depth, okay? <laughs> Again, there are so many coincidences that it's kind of hard to just brush them away. And note, again, that they refer to each other as best friends, which we know the importance that lingers in that term for our current situation. All right, nothing further, your honor. The defense rests. <laughs> what is your thoughts on this ship and what is your favorite evidence? Drop it down below in the comments. And now with that comes the most highly requested ship of all time. I'm obsessed. Hey, it's Amiko time. When I was planning out the first video, I knew there was so much to talk about with Amiko, so I knew they needed to be the finale of their own video. So I just kind of already decided they'd be in part two, which I didn't make clear to you guys. And I almost got shot in the public square for not even mentioning them. So my bad, I just, they're just so canon to me that I just kind of forgot to say some things. So my bad. They were always gonna be in part two. Sorry for making you guys think that I was gonna forget about them. I didn't. Anyways, let's talk about the gayest people in this game. Shall we? Also, this is technically a uh, hearsay in a court of law, but literally yesterday I was having tea with Yaimiko and she told me all about their passionate makeout session together. So like you heard it here first folks, I'm joking. Also shout out to Visper for making me a whole Amiko document and also to Wolfstress and Richard underscore Miko for giving me additional points in sources to look into. Thanks guys. All right, so to begin, of course, a little bit of background. Yaimiko is a kitsune who oversees the Grand Narukami Shrine and the Yai Publishing House. She is sneaky, mischievous, flirty, cunning, and gorgeous. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm 
Okay. Anyways, she aids the traveler during the Inazuma Archon quest to bring the end to the Vision Hunt decree, rid Inazuma of the Fatui, and to bring the real Electro Archon, A, back to the real world again. Her and A are very close, which is the 10th time I've said that in this video, and they hold a great amount of respect and absolute trust in the other. And it was only Yai who could have gotten A out of her hiding. A is the god of eternity, a mantle she took on after her twin sister, Makoto died in the cataclysm. A took on her responsibilities as Archon, but also the crippling sorrow of her sister's loss. Afraid of losing anyone else or herself to erosion and change, A hid herself in the plane of Euthymia, a world of her inner consciousness, and built a puppet, the Raiden Shogun, to replace her as Archon and maintain a strict order of eternity over Inazuma. Change was not encouraged, as it was a threat to eternity, and Inazuma was cut off from the rest of Devat. The Vision Hunt decree was enacted. A lot of this was due to like Fatui involvement, yada, 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 okay? Where do the lesbians come in? Well, as you could surmise from my summary, A is very stubborn, stuck in her own ways, and uh, very bad at processing her emotions and coping with trauma. Yai is very different and is probably the only one in Inazuma that is able to understand A and help A get back to living again. In the Archon Quest, when the Traveler faces off against A in the Plane of Euthymia, Yai is teleported into the realm at the perfect moment to tuck some sense into A. A is surprised to see her lifelong dear friend again. After 500 years of being apart, the sky turns a soft shade of pink, which Yai points out, saying that that must mean A is happy to see her again. A says, seeing you again is a change to eternity and a very nice surprise. Soon, A comes to her senses, abolishes the vision hunt decree, and embarks on the path to healing again for herself and her nation. So uh, yeah, whatever, they're just best friends whose friendship withstood the test of time and a uh, long distance. So uh, doesn't mean they're gay. Well, this is where the coding comes in. Besides them being intrinsically linked in every aspect and are another example of a two for one deal, where if one shows up, the other is closely behind or will be mentioned and they are in a lot of official art together. They also have a lot of coding in their voice lines, autumn descriptions, and limited time events. I really don't think Yai is trying to be subtle with her thoughts and opinions on A. They are very suggestive and obvious to anyone who has basic reading comprehension skills. And Miko's about the Raiden Shogun line, she states this. Locking herself away in the plane of Euthymia when she clearly wants to be out. It's just willful self-torture, really. <laughs> On the other hand, it's also rather stubborn but cute, don't you think? Stubborn but cute? I honestly wouldn't talk about my gal pal like, wow, my pal totally trapped herself in solitude and neglected our friendship and her whole nation of people. But it kind of points out how stubborn but cute she is at the same time. Aw, my little pookie. In Yai's When Thunder Strikes voice line, she states this. Many people dread the sound of thunder. To me, it sounds fondly familiar. Which of course, thunder symbolizing A. Her finding comfort in thunder is repeated again in her good night voice line, where she finds it hard to sleep without the sound of thunder. Which when you think about it too hard, kind of implies something sus, but uh, don't, don't think about it too hard, okay? A's about Yai line talks about how shrewd and resourceful she has become, and that she constantly outfoxes, pun intended, A, and mocks her often. Yai is the only one in all of Tevat that can poke fun at A and lives to tell the tale and poking fun and teasing is almost all she does. They understand the other on a level that no one else does around them, and it is very obvious in almost every single one of their interactions. In A's story quest, she fights her evil shadow self, the puppet, and the duel of the century in like a, a separate dimension. The puppet will not let go of the concept of eternity, and A has to prove her resolve to change by engaging in a life or death duel with this puppet for hundreds of years. I think like only a day or a few hours pass in the real world, but A is in there swearing sweating and fighting for so long. Like it's insane. Before A goes in for this battle, she states that she leaves all responsibilities in Miko's hands. And when Traveler goes to Miko like, hey, your girlfriend, she's being <laughs> reckless again. Yai hurries to try and find where A is. And before sending in the Traveler to go help A, she tells them, I'm placing my God in your capable hands. When I heard this, I was kind of like, that's a little fruity. And this was before I knew that they were like a really popular ship. If two plus two equals four and five plus five equals 10, then I don't know how to do math. After A wins and returns to the real world, the traveler tries to bring up what Yai said about calling A her god. And before the traveler could get the sentence out, Yai interrupts and quickly changes the subject and A is kind of confused by this. Miko didn't want A to know about her simp ass line. <laughs> Next up would be the very obvious self-insert fan fiction that Yai Miko made between her 
Mirror and The Raiden Shogun that she made all of Inazuma read during the Iridori Festival. First off, the banners and decorations for the festival were literally just a Miko fan art, with the two faces being plastered everywhere. During the festival, the Yai Publishing House released and heavily advertised their newest title, Pretty Please Kitsune Guji, which focused on the relationship between the Raiden Shogun and a shrine maiden named Yai Masako. Yai Masako is described as having fluffy ears close to the Raiden Shogun and is dressed in red and white. So it's Yai, obviously. In the excerpt told in the Shogun's POV, Masako is making the Shogun's favorite meal after waiting for the Shogun to return from her duties. Very domestic. Raiden also explains how much she relies on the shrine maiden, how she's the only prominent person in her life, and how she doesn't want to let her down. She then goes to bed and wishes for Masako to be there so she could fall asleep on her lap to her singing voice. But Masako isn't there and her chambers are cold because of it. And there's also a part when Masako calls the Raiden Shogun good girl. <sighs> Okay. Additionally, as pointed out by TikTok user Yovodo, there is some sneaky coating in the drink Rainbow Aster. This drink is featured in the novel and is also a drink that you could purchase during the Iridori Festival. Yovodo explains how similar the name of the drink sounds like to the phrase, only wanna be with you in Mandarin, and also how the drink's price, 7,125 mora, sounds like please love me when spoken aloud in Mandarin. I will let Yovodo explain it again with the proper pronunciation so you can really see how similar they sound. So take it away. The name for Rainbow Aster in Mandarin is pronounced Ni. This is really important because it sounds like Ni. Only want to be with you. Now the price for the drink is also a potential Easter egg because it is 7,125 moras. Please love me. Later, Yovoto explains how the act of naming drinks with homophones and other sneaky planned words is often very common in China, and they do it to say things they wouldn't normally say out loud. So it is a valid point to point out. Ew. Cringe. Gay. What do you mean this exists? Why put the effort into making this exist? In Yai's weapon description, Kagura's Verity, it tells a very poetic tale of Yai finding her place by A's side, losing her master and going throughout history wishing to be in A's gaze again. She states her wish to be by A's side and says, and her excellency, whom I might dare to call friend, should have more time yet to roam this world. So, let us see this imperfect world together and enjoy its obsessions with love and hate, with meetings and partings. She continues describing the history she has experienced, finishing off the description with, So, Your Excellency, might I still have the pleasure of joining you to watch the first pale purple buds that emerge when the snow next melts? Oh my god! Dude, I hate gay people! <laughs> Slash J. It's just, I'm pissed. I'm pissed. That's, that's a, that's homosexual. They also have the same exact bird in their idols, a bird they share with Wanderer, who is technically a son, though she doesn't remember that anymore. The fact they all share the same bird shows their interconnectedness of a sort of family, though highly dysfunctional and not at all cute. Additionally, let's look at their designs. Twitter user Mochi underscore Ri made a very interesting thread pointing out the coding in Yai Miko specifically for her lesbianism. <laughs> Why did I say it like that? <laughs> Mochi points out how sweet and flirty Yai is with other women, but is mean or rude to men. This is shown in that one gay ass interaction with one of the shrine maidens and how she talks about Aika, Kokomi, A, and Kirara very fondly, but makes Goro petrified to be around her, calls Aito a rascal, <laughs> which he is, and makes Toma weary of her. As Mochi points out, this is unfortunately enforcing the mean lesbian stereotype, which I agree with. But as Mochi also correctly points out, stereotypes really help with getting queer coding across to an audience, no matter how poor in taste they are. Yai and A also have matching anklets, with Yai's being on her left ankle and A's on her right. It should be noted that wearing an anklet on your left ankle is a code for lesbianism, and in Japanese culture, it is a symbol of marriage. The Inazuma birthday cake is literally just a cake with Yai and A's combined design patterns filled with hydrangeas, which are a symbol of gratitude apology, and strong emotions in Japan. Where the story goes that a Japanese emperor once gave these flowers to the girl he loved in an act of apology for neglecting her while focusing on his duties. Very much A, neglecting Yai for 500 years to focus on her eternity duties. Pink hydrangeas symbolize love, and blue for apology and forgiveness. And then 
folks, for the peace de resistance, the thing that ties everything together. Are you ready to hear it? Are you on the edge of your seat? Can I get a drum roll, please? Thank you. A and Yai are Genshin Impact's versions of Honkai Impact's Yai Sakura and Raiden Mei, who are confirmed lesbians. I mean, hey. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Before we start running down to the comments, no, the connection between these sets of characters have not been officially confirmed in any capacity, but Warriorverse has a trend of including the same character, but in a different reality across their games. For example, Branya and Sila show up as different versions of themselves throughout the Honkai franchises and often have different personalities, but they always end up finding each other and falling in love. So it's not a stretch to say that Raiden Mei exists as the Raiden Shogun in Genshin. For one, the name. For two, the design, and for three, May is described as the Queen of Thunder, neglects her own feelings, and is used to living in solitary. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? She is confirmed a lesbian, for she only shows attraction to other women and is in love with Kiana, who also reciprocates. Yai Sakura is known as a heretic Miko and is very similar in design to Yai, though from what I read from the wikis, their personalities don't really match up, but that happens often with other Honkai characters across franchises. Yai Sakura is also confirmed lesbian, falling in love with Kaylin, who is a girl. So again, Hoyoverse has a past of canonizing queer couples and A Miko is based off of already confirmed lesbian characters. Now to address some complaints about A Miko on the basis of their allegations of them being a pro ship. <laughs> So people call a Miko a, a pro ship or a problematic ship because people claim that A watched over Yai as Yai grew up and they call this behavior. Okay, so the only bits of evidence that I found that A might have met Yai when Yai was younger was the fact that Yai traveled to the Grand Narakami Shrine to be taught by the Kitsune Saigu, who was a family member she adored and who died in the Cataclysm. In volume six of the New Chronicles of the Six Kitsune, Yai didn't go and fight in the war because she was too Young. The Kitsune Saigu was killed when she left to join the side of the Shogun in the fight, and Yai was devastated. I didn't read anywhere that A knew her really well when she was young. They weren't at all close if they had met, but only got closer when Yai was like grown up. All in all, I think the term <laughs> is very serious. It's a very potent, strong, disgusting word. If A was a <laughs> that would imply that A was there with Yai very frequently since she was a child and helped raise her, which she did not, and manipulated Yai into having romantic feelings for her and forcing her to become entirely dependent on A, which is severely not the case at all. That is what <laughs> means, guys. It's not some word you can just throw around. Hey, if you are a hater of the ship, please just be a hater. Please do not water down words that are very strong and disgusting like this one, just because you dislike this ship. If anything, it's an age gap problem, which is also the problem with Zhang Qi, which is Zhang Lian child, and y'all still eat that up like crazy. But if the very thought of A being older when Yai was younger at any point in time, regardless of whether or not they knew each other, if that thought makes you uncomfortable, then please, by all means, do not interact with stuff that includes this ship. Stay away from the ship and just take care of yourselves. But do not bully or harass others for your opinion. Okay, and with that final piece of discussion, I want to hereby state that yes, these is gay. Good for them. Good for them. <laughs> We did it, Joe. So, in conclusion, a lot of coincidences, huh? Hoyo has a past with gay stuff being canon. They can't be obvious with Genshin like they have been in the past with queer couples in their previous Honkai games because Genshin is a behemoth of a game franchise and it's under much stricter surveillance. But the queer representation and the queer coding is in the details and the things that people often overlook and if you are willing to look at them with an open mind and heart. So with their past taken into account, all the undeniable queer coding that I've brought to you today, the intricacies of queer censorship in the environment the game is existing in and how risky it is just to like insinuate these things. I want to again hereby state that Genshin Impact is a queer game.
Okay, so I'm exhausted. <laughs> this script is 20 pages long. Hallelujah. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to give it a like and also consider subscribing so I can continue to make these really fun, deep dive, intricate, video essays. <laughs> also, please make sure to join us at twitch.tv forward slash e is social to talk about this video essay live and to hang out with a really cool community. Also, please make sure to comment your favorite piece of evidence that I talked about in today's video or any pieces of evidence that I didn't include. I want to say thank you so much for all the love and support that you guys gave me for the last video. It is just so cool that we are able to talk about this as a community and it's just honestly so exciting. So I wanted to say thank you so much for the support and the love. It's so cool. I most likely will be making a part three to this because there's more NPCs that just exist in the wild that I did not cover in the first video and of course not in this video. So if you are interested, make sure to comment down below if you would like a part three and any other discussions you'd like me to talk about more in depth, I would love to hear them. Join the Discord as well. Again, it's linked in the description as well as all the other sources that I used to write this behemoth of a script. Also, of course, I want to thank these amazingly beautiful people in our community, for not only providing me with extensive research to aid me in this researching writing journey, but also proofreading and just being there for when I'm having like a meltdown. So thank you guys. I love you guys so much. You guys are so real. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank you for watching this until the very, very end. So if I don't see you on Twitch, then I'll see you in the next one. Okay. Bye. Hey Slay, you're probably wondering what that is. I'm sorry. It's Halloween, bitch. I hope he scared you throughout this whole video. Anyways, love you, bye.